Thank you, Simon. And of course, I particularly welcome to Professor Stephen Gill, who I'll introduce properly in just a moment. So as, as we, we've mentioned, uh, we'd very much welcome your comments and your questions as we go. Um, these can be made in the, in the chat, of course, um, and we've already had one or two in advance that we'll try to bring in if we can. Um, we're recording the webinar. Um, there'll only be uh, our faces that are recorded, so I hope that's okay with everybody. Um, and any other questions or anything else you'd like to raise, please do put in the chat box, of course. So as with last week, uh, the format uh, is going to be that Simon and I are asking Stephen questions for the first half. We'll have a five minute break. And then after the break, uh, there'll be something special where Stephen will be introducing us to one or two items from his collection, which you can see marvelously in the background. Stephen has a great collection of first editions of Wordsworth, uh, some of them with very uh, particular aspects and associations. So we'll be looking at one or two of those just after the break. Um, after that, uh, there'll be more questions and hopefully that's the moment when we can uh, ask the questions that you're asking as we're, as we're going along. We'll then finish I think, Stephen, with a brief reading from one of your books uh, before we close, just before nine. So, Stephen Gill, Professor Stephen Gill, uh, Professor Emeritus at Oxford University, is University, Supernumerary Fellow at Lincoln College, uh, a long-serving trustee of the Wordsworth Trust, also director of the Wordsworth Winter School. Um, and as for his publications, um, I just had to read uh, my bookshelves at home. I don't, I don't have this one. This is the um, Salisbury Plain Poems. This was the first volume in the Cornell Wordsworth series, um, which is a, a, the great series on Wordsworth manuscripts uh, in which the poems are reproduced photographically with a, with a transcription. And th this, was the, this was the first in that landmark series. Um, in no particular order, um, uh, selections of Wordsworth, major works of Wordsworth, um, the Oxford Authors, Wordsworth, um, Wordsworth and the Victorians, uh, Guide to the Lakes, uh, Wordsworth Revisitings, uh, the, o the Cambridge Companion to Wordsworth. Um, is, it, is it nine o'clock yet? I, um, <laughs> I, I've forgotten some of these, yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> they're, they're well read and they're well, they're well annotated. Uh, the first edition of the biography, 1989. Yep. 1989. Yep, and then the book that we've come to focus on tonight, of course, the, um, the second edition, I guess, uh, or the revised edition of words of bi the biography. And uh, look at that compared to the two. This must have been something discovered in the last 30 years. That it's has a, mostly to do with the paper, I think, Jeff, but anyway. Oh, well, <laughs> I think that's not right, actually, but we, we'll, we can disagree later. Um, it's a real treasure, um, of course it's a real treasure, uh, like, like his other writings. Um, it shows Stephen Gill as the man who knows Wordsworth, and we've got in this library um, a Wordsworth edition of Milton that was given to him by Charles Lamb, and uh, Lamb has inscribed it to Wordsworth, to the best knower of Milton, and I think many of us would agree that Stephen is the best knower of Wordsworth. Um, it's a literary biography, you come to know Wordsworth through his writings, uh, and with Stephen's words seamlessly intertwined with the, with the poet. Um, it's a joy, it's beautifully written, there's fresh insight, and you do get over 100 pages of footnotes. So it, it's, a, it, it's <laughs> a tremendous <laughs> book. <laughs> um, and as you can see from the pile of books, um, Stephen's works have been, for me, particularly an inspiration and a guiding light, um, especially through the recent uh, reinterpretation of the site. But if we, if we start maybe Stephen, thinking of your associations with, with the lakes, with Wordsworth, uh, with the trust, I, I remember you telling me very fondly of a, of a memorable first visit or an early visit. Yeah, I think it was in the company of Jonathan Wordsworth. It was. I, I, was, I was very fortunate in having as my college tutor um, a descendant of the poet's brother. But actually, uh, Jonathan Wordsworth never made very much of that. At that time, he was mainly interested in in uh, late medieval literature. So I didn't come to Wordsworth through Jonathan Wordsworth, but he brought me up to the Lake District in, oh, I, it was the winter of 1964 when I was uh, just beginning as a graduate student. Now you've got to remember, I was born and bred in Birmingham. I'd never seen a mountain before in my life. And we drove up in his car and then you had to crawl through Kendall in those days before the big main road was bitten. 
And you come up onto what Wordsworth himself calls the heights of Kendall, the beginning of book four in the prelude. And there in front of me was the Lake District Mountains, half snow covered. And it was a sort of epiphanic moment, Jeff, really. I don't see anything remotely like it. And I know, that, I know this, 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 this might sound a bit self-aggrandizing or, or, or pompous, but do you remember in the prelude, Wordsworth talks once about coming back. I think he's been dancing all night somewhere. Mm. And it's the dawn and he's looking out and he sees just all the sweetness of a common dawn. And Wordsworth says, uh, I made no vows, but vows were then made for me. Uh, and in a way, I, I think I've felt like that ever since this vision. Well, things got stronger. Where were we going to stay? We were going to stay in a house called the Stepping Stones, which is still there between Rydal and Ambleside, with Mrs. Dorothy Dixon, a direct descendant of the poet. And... Uh, this old lady was very welcoming to me. And when we went into the, uh, her main room, a fire crackling away, books on the shelves, she said, oh, Mr. Gill, if any of the books interest you, do take one down. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mrs. Dixon. So I walked to the bookshelves and looked. The first thing I saw was a book with lyrical ballads. Well, I knew what lyrical ballads was. This was a little two volumes, leather. I picked it down, opened it, and there was the inscription, which, Jeff, you have in front of you, do you? I've got it in front of me. Now, just imagine, I'm a graduate student interested in William Wordsworth. I open this book, and it reads, yeah. given to Mary Hutchinson, sorry, given to Sarah Hutchinson on the night of our wedding, Gallow Hill, October the 2nd, 1802. I practically fainted on the spot. Here was the book that Wordsworth gave to his sister-in-law. Well, I won't go on anymore. That was the beginning, really, of, a, of, of an association, which I've treasured for 60 or more years, with Wordsworth's books, the Wordsworth family, the Wordsworth trust, and with the poet and the poet himself. What, what's very nice about this book, of course, too, uh, it's always nice when these tie up, evidence-wise. And in the in the beginning, there is the gift that shows that it's the same. Oh, from Dorothy Dixon. Dixon. Yeah, yes, it's Dorothy yeah. Dixon. Yeah. yeah, yes, that's very good. In very 19, good. 1967. Yeah, that's wonderful. So your, your your early days in the library. I'm sitting here in the Jerwood Centre, climate controlled. Uh, I mean, it's still cold, but climate yes. controlled. <laughs> yeah. um, and you know the best facilities that, that uh, <laughs> Heritage Lottery Fund money could buy. A bit different when you first came to the, the earlier words of library. Um, the temperature was much the same, uh, <laughs> but everything else was different. The library um, was the lower floor of what was really a barn, and the upper floor, I think, was still in use by a farmer. Um, on the, on the, the, the lower floor, there was one table in the middle, one angle poised lamp that didn't always work, a nice big coke fire, which we used to stoke up with uh, coke to keep the place warm. And all around the room were cupboards with cardboard boxes in, in which were Wordsworth's manuscripts, letters, the whole works. So I actually started my career opening boxes, not knowing what I would find inside, and perhaps coming across the first uh, drafts of the prelude. Well, uh, what can you expect? The hook rather takes under those circumstances. We used to get coffee at, uh, halfway through the morning too, brought by the lady who opened the door for us. So what with the Coke and the coffee and the manuscripts, it was very nice. And very different, let me just <laughs> <end up. laughs> And very different, yes. Yeah, we don't have the coffee. And an honorary librarian for a time. We, we the, no, that, living in, in the lake, didn't it? That was one of the happiest of accidents, Chef. The, 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 the lady who looked after the place, it was only, the, the library was only open by appointment in the winter months and for a week or two in the summer. Mm. And she had an accident, uh, broke her hip, couldn't do the job. And it was suggested to me that I might run the place during the summer uh, on, on, for a little while. Uh, and so actually for about five or six glorious years, I spent the summer 
uh, looking after the library and living in the Lake District. So, um, so, so the, the, the great knowledge you have of the manuscripts, this is kind of the beginnings and the development. The big, yes, yes, Jeff. Well, and I think the other big boon of that, of course, which I am very well aware of how lucky I was, over the course of those years, I met all the great Coleridge scholars, Wordsworth scholars of, of the day. Um, uh, mm. who would come to Grasmere, yeah. Mm. Mm. I think there's what I want to say to that, Jeff, though, is nothing has happened since then to in any way diminish or impair my sense of commitment to the, the poetry. I mean, no matter how much I stress anecdotally what a joy it was to be in the lakes and to know people and so on, I wouldn't still be doing this if I didn't think that it's the poetry which mm -hmm. is what sustains. Yeah. I mean, that, that for me is something that comes across very strongly in the biography itself, Stephen. Um, I mean, I think, uh, well, congratulations on the second edition, first of all. I mean, the, the first edition I, I have found in, indispensable um, over the years. It's on the shelf next to next to my desk. Um, and I've, I've always found it um, a, a very powerful and, and moving biography, as well as a very uh, factually informative one. I think you're able to capture sort of Wordsworth's character in all his, in all his complexity, um, but also to really capture the, the spirit of the poetry too. Um, but but I, what, what's always impressed me is the way in which you combine um, both a sort of critical response to the best known pieces of Wordsworth. So there's fantastic readings of Tintin Abbey, for example, and of um, the Intimations Ode, um, along with the kind of encyclopedic coverage of areas of Wordsworth studies that might not be as well known to other people. I mean, I, I was once working on a project on Napoleon and found the, the stuff in, in there on the Convention of Sintra. Uh, for example, extremely um, useful. Uh, more recently, I was working on something on Wordsworth politics and just looked to see, you know, if you had anything on the address to the, the freeholders of Westmoreland, and indeed, and indeed, you did. So, um, <laughs> you know, mm. I, I challenge anyone to find an aspect of, you know, a piece of writing by Wordsworth that you don't, you don't cover um, in it. But I particularly wanted to ask you about, I mean, to use your own phrase, you know, the notion of Wordsworth's revisitings and then your own revisitings of Wordsworth. Um, so obviously Wordsworth is the great poet of revisiting, isn't he? As you argue in your book of that title, um, both revisiting place, as people will know from works like Tintin Abbey, returning to the same place five years later, uh, but also revisiting his own manuscripts uh, and rewriting them. And, you know, I wonder how it then felt as, as a biographer to revisit a work that you'd initially written uh, 30 years ago. You know, what the motivation behind that revisiting was and, and what you learned from it. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think it, it, the answer to this has to be one, I think, of, uh, as it were, ascending complexity. The... Um, the, the motivation really was that I, I, I thought the book was needed. I, there, there, was, there was no, um, you had a whole new generation of readers for whom there was no single volume biography of Wordsworth that stressed as I hoped to do his poetic achievement. So in a way I wanted to, I wanted to um, speak to a new generation in a way that I, hoped I'd done in 1989. Um, but of course, there was also the, uh, undoubtedly the, the drive of knowing that this was a much older man <laughs> revisiting what he had written when he was a much younger man about a poet who spent all of his life doing precisely that. And um, so there's no question that I, I have, I felt very involved in a way in Wordsworth's, well, as I said in the, in the book, Wordsworth's revisitings. Um, going back to my, the first book, I'm, I'm startled by the confidence of it. So uh, <laughs> you will know this, Simon. I find myself reading a sentence and thinking, what? Uh, I've said 
most certainly Wordsworth thought such and such, whereas now I write, it may well be that Wordsworth thought such and such, but that's all trivial stuff, that soon goes. I think what, what I wanted to bring out, what I discovered I wanted to bring out in the writing of, the, of this revised version is a, a greater emphasis, I think, on um, Wordsworth um, within the community, the, the, the body of people, as Colbert pointed out, who, uh, who, who supported and surrounded him. And this means Dorothy, it means his wife, Mary, it means Sarah Hutchinson, as well as the wider circle. I wanted to emphasize in a way that I just hadn't done in the first book, Wordsworth's courage. We could talk a bit more about that if you want to. The courage that, that took him back to the lakes in 1799 to try to live uh, a, a life of kind of disciplined poverty um, for a greater purpose, namely the, the poetry he wanted to write. And I think Finally, most of all, also, I, I wanted to see if I could bring out my sense of Wordsworth's continual attempt to maintain a kind of hold over his own life. The nothing must be lost, everything must be assessed. Um, there's a sort of flinty determination to let nothing go that I perhaps rather admire, and which I think the, the poetry most certainly embodies. So uh, if, if, if I've achieved some of that, then that was, then I will have done what I wanted to do in the book, really. Uh, does that answer the question? It does very much, but I'd like to pick up on some of that, if I may. And I, we're already getting questions in the chat box, I think, where people are picking up on these things and um, you know, asking about other elements they've noticed of the, of the second edition. Um, it's very interesting. I was very interested by the way you started there by talking about the community, uh, the importance of, of the community around him, and particularly um, the women in his life. Yes. Um, but, I mean, this has been a big theme on the online course we've just done with Future Learn. People have been very interested in that. So I'm sure they'd like to hear a bit more about that. I mean, it did feel to me like this was an area that you'd expanded in the book. I mean, I think there's one uh, new section where you talk about three astonishing treks that William and Dorothy yes, yeah. go on, for, for, exa for example. And similarly, I mean, I think the, the, the later stages of the book, it seemed to me you, you put uh, much more emphasis on the relationship with Isabella Fenwick as well, mm. who may be mm. a figure who's not so well known uh, mm. to, many of, to many of our listeners. So I wonder if you could just say about a bit more about those, those key relationships mm. with women. Mm. Mm. Yes. Um, uh, I want to start really by saying that the key relationship uh, that, that, that I'd want to stress is in fact with Mary Wordsworth. And it, it's simply the case that um, we don't have uh, uh, the sort of documentation that, that you have in Dorothy's journals. We don't have a lot of anecdotes and information about William and Mary. What we do have, of course, is the astonishing letters that pass between them in after their 10 years of marriage which show just how profound their love for each other was and how sexually strong it was and so on and how much Wordsworth owed to that uh, that strength in his life now for those of you who get right through to the last paragraph of the book uh, you will find that I, I, I describe Mary Wordsworth as a as wise and steadfast and a heroine if ever there was one. And I, I really think she was, and I don't think she gets her due. Now, Dorothy, of course, uh, uh, the, uh, what she gave to Wordsworth, the, the closeness, the creative, emotional intimacy that the two of them had. What I want to do, Simon, if I may, is read Wordsworth's tribute to Dorothy, which I think is little known and I would like to know that anybody could tell me that he wrote more beautiful lines than this. This is Wordsworth writing about Dorothy when they came to Grasmere, 1799, 1800, and started life there together. Mine eyes did ne'er rest on a lovely object, nor my mind take pleasure in the midst of happy thoughts. 
but either she whom now I have, who now divides with me this loved abode, was there or not far off. Where'er my footsteps turned, her voice was like a hidden bird that sang. The thought of her was like a flash of light or an unseen companionship, a breath of fragrance, independent of the wind. <laughs> a tribute? Right. Um, the two of them had key moments in their lives, which Wordsworth never describes them in the poetry as spots of time, but that's what they are. The entry into the lakes in 1794, when they just pause at, at low wood there on Windermere before pushing up towards Windy Brow and Kendall. The astonishing journey they made in 1799 in the winter to come and start life in, in Dove Cottage. Uh, and their 1803 Scottish tour in astonishing conditions, bringing them closer and closer together. And of course, Dorothy writes about these things, as does William. So we have some sense of what it, what it meant to both of them. Now, Isabella Fennick, I'd like to do some more work on Isabella Fennick, a lady that uh, the Wordsworths become very close to in, uh, in, in his later life. Um, she was, I think, um, brisk, highly intelligent, not awed by him, uh, which was a <laughs> very good thing. And Wordsworth clearly became uh, very close to her and, and, and eager to have her good opinion. And of course, it's to Isabella Fennick that eventually he, he, he partly dictates, creates the notes that he wrote upon the whole of his poetic output called, which we always call the Fennick notes. Now, I don't, I think Seamus Heaney has done something comparable, but I don't know of another body of work of quite such uh, majesty as, as Wordsworth's Fennick notes. 1843, he's 73 years old looking back over everything he's done. Um, so we owe Isabel Fennig, I think, a great deal. Yeah. Another great example of revisiting. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, she got one thing very badly wrong. Um, she thought that Mr. Wordsworth ought to end his life in the shadow of a great cathedral. No, no, no. <laughs> Wordsworth ended his life walking on White Moss Common and catching a bad cold and then falling ill. Uh, she got that wrong, but everything else I think she was right about. Fantastic, thank you. I, th I think, Stephen, this sort of raises the, um, the issue of sort of the, the folks on the later life. Um, and Bruce Graver has got an interesting question in the chat box here, but I might hand over to Jeff to, uh, to pick up on that if he's... If he's yeah. Mm. yeah, so, so, so Bruce's question. Um, Stephen, you've expanded, revised the account of later words within the second edition. Would you comment on why you did that? And in what ways your views of the late Wordsworth have changed? Yes. Um, I think in, um, in the biography as it was, and as it now is, and in the book Wordsworth's Revisitings, um, and perhaps elsewhere in odd places, I've made it plain um, why I think the poetry of Wordsworth matters and continues to matter. What I want, so that's there, that I don't need to enlarge that for the revised biography, not in my view. What I come to think is that the, 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 the life of Wordsworth from mm, uh, 1815 onwards, is of a highly intelligent, sensitive, responsive man, pretty much involved in the uh, the, the affairs of his country, uh, the politically, religious interested, and so on. And that his responsiveness to all of this is of itself of great interest. But Wordsworth actually becomes, and this Jeff is where Wordsworth and the Victorians book comes in. Mm -hmm. Wordsworth, in his own lifetime becomes a cultural force. And in due course, people are referring to him you know, as if he was um, some sort of sage, which I think he found increasingly irksome. 
So all of this, I, I wanted to, I wanted to bring out the interest of it, of a life which is all too often simply dismissed as growingly conservative. Of course, it was growingly conservative in interesting sorts of ways, which I hoped I brought out. Mm. And and that partly answers uh, a question from Stephen Carl that, that that we received ahead. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah. about your views on on if you like the disappearance of words as idealism and how they've changed over time. And I think I think. <laughs> That one. Now look, that's a that's a really tricky one. See, I don't think Wordsworth's idea. I don't know what it would mean to say Wordsworth's idealism mm. disappeared. Um, he certainly didn't think it had. Um, do we as commentators have a right to use language quite like that about somebody's idealism? disappearing. Wordsworth, he clashed with James Losh, didn't he, in the 1820s, when his old friend Losh said, you know, you've, uh, you've gone over to the enemy, as it were, you've changed. And Wordsworth says, no, I haven't changed. It's circumstances that have changed and the political situation that has changed. Now, that won't do quite as an answer either. But nor do I see it as simply cut and dry that we're to look at Wordsworth having become what we now call right wing. It, it won't do, Jeff. There's more to it. If I were, if there's a third edition of the book, which of course there won't be, the, were there to be a third edition, there's a footnote going to go in. When the 1832 reform bill is being uh, planned, Wordsworth writes what I've described in the book as a grotesque observation that if the reform bill passes, it will be the greatest shock known to the history of the world or some nonsense of that sort. What I didn't know was that the young William Gladstone, former prime minister, future prime minister of this country, massive liberal figure, when he was young, thought so too. At exactly that moment, he's writing a letter which says precisely that. Now, I would want to bring together the young William Gladstone, the old William Wordsworth or older William Wordsworth and say, look, such was the, the, the ferment and turmoil about this proposed reform bill that very remarkably different people were thinking it was the end of the world. Mm. They were both badly wrong. I mean, it's something that you brought to my attention um, um, in, in the past is the postscript to the Yarrow Revisited. Yes, yes, yes. 1935, mm. uh, and also perhaps words as poem humanity of the year before, where, where he's clearly, his politics may, you know, we may say were, were conservative as it were against, against that, that shock, but still the sense of humanity of the people who were tied to the, to the factory system. I mean, words as humanity is very much there. It is indeed, and and the the prose uh, uh, postscript to the volume Yarrow Revisited really ought to be known, Jeff, in a way that I think the preface to the lyrical ballads are known. It's mm. there that that uh, Wordsworth is aligned with um, many other social reformers of that moment against the New Poor Law. Mm. Okay. But what I think, the sentence I want to take away from that, I, I can't quote it verbatim, but Wordsworth says something to the effect that he has no doubt that the gentlemen who are creating this Poor Law Amendment Act are men of goodwill and good intentions. But it is his view that the act proceeds rather too much as if it is the working man's own fault that he is not as they say, before the world rather than behind it, something like that. That needs to be said. It's right. Mm. And it was, there it is, 1835. Mm. Next year, you've got Oliver Twist. Mm. That brings us sort of neatly to another kind of revisiting, um, which is uh, Walter Scott. And, ah. you, and you know, the, the importance of relationship with Mary, with Dorothy, but the importance of the relationship with Sir Walter Scott uh, you've got an unvisiting, a visiting, and a revisiting. But that very poignant visit in 1831, when uh, he and his daughter Dora see Walter Scott for the last time, and, and I think that that's just so beautifully described in the book. I wonder if you could just say a little bit about that. 
Mm, yes, yes. I, I, uh, I, I developed that a little bit in the book, Jeff. You're quite right, rather than in the first edition. Um, and uh, it may be, you know, that, that there are things in this later book which uh, could only have been written because I'm 30 years older than I was when I wrote the first. And this, this is surely one of them. Wordsworth first meets Sir Walter Scott, Walter Scott as he then was, in 1803, and uh, is, is much taken with him, likes him a lot. And he writes the poem, Yarrow Unvisited, about not going to see the River Yarrow, as he says to Scott, not without a thought of pleasing you. In 1805, Wordsworth climbs Helvellyn with Scott, they're coming back from Patterdale, and he's got Humphrey Davy in tow. And Scott entertains the two of them with uh, anecdotes and so on, says Wordsworth, as was his wont. Humphrey Davy got fed up with this and cleared off the two men together. Wordsworth never forgot this day of climbing Helvellyn over to Grasmere uh, with Sir Walter Scott. It was sort of a, a very much a spot of time for him. In 1831, Sir Walter Scott says, you better come and visit me because if you don't, it might be too late. And Wordsworth and Dora go up, as you say, and he finds Walter Scott, who's had a series of little strokes in a you know, terrible state, really. Um, they have some days together, um, evenings, Scott's daughter playing the harp and singing songs. They go out to visit Newark Tower and so on. Um, but uh, when they come to part, Wordsworth says that he hopes Scott's forthcoming trip to Italy will, will be good for him. And as they stand there, S Scott says to him, well, yes, but when I am there, Though it is fair, twill be another Yarrow. He's quoting Wordsworth's Yarrow Unvisited. Now, I can't imagine anything more astonishing, really, than to bring these two poets together at this moment when they both know they're parting. And Wordsworth referring back to that, uh, Scott referring back to that gift. That, uh, 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 right. Uh, Wordsworth never sees Scott again. But within 48 hours, he's written a sonnet that I'm going to read, if I may, which it, 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 this is this um, is this is on the departure of Sir Walter Scott for Naples. And in the first uh, line or two, there's a reference to the Eildon's triple height. Uh, I, 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 in the book, I print a picture of the, 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 the triple height mountain. But this is the departure of Sir Walter Scott from Abbotsford for Naples. Um, a trouble, not of clouds or weeping rain, nor of the setting sun's pathetic light engendered, hangs or Eildon's triple height. Spirits of power assembled there, complain for kindred power departing from their sight, while Tweed, best pleased in chanting a blithe strain, saddens his voice again and yet again. Lift up your hearts, ye mourners, for the might of the whole world's good wishes with him goes. Blessings and prayers in nobler retinue than sceptred king or laurelled conqueror knows follow this wondrous potentate. Be true, ye winds of ocean and the midland sea, wafting your charge to soft Parthenope. Now, anybody ever says to me that Wordsworth in his old age couldn't write, that's the, that's the sonnet to read, I think. Wafting your charge to soft Parthenope. How many years later? Um, seven, eight. Wordsworth thinking about, in Italy, he's remembering that 1805, climbing of Helvellyn mm. and the Wizard of the North 
and how broken he was in later years, but not then. And in the, the longish poem, which, which is not gonna be anybody's favorite poem called Musings Near Aqua Pendente, there's a passage where he, he talks of Scott on that mountain range and those two together in our day of youth. Now, the key to this is that those lines Wordsworth had written in 1800 or so, they appear in one of the manuscripts of the poem, Michael. So the old man is going right back to lines he wrote earlier about the Fairfield Mass and Helvellyn and so on, to bring into poetry that memory of being with Scott on exactly that spot. I've, I've always thought that's the, uh, that's the kind of core revisiting, if you want to put to one. Mm. Because you're visiting your own poetry, your own memory, and the man you loved. There's a lovely moment where Wordsworth, in one of his letters, just said, Walter Scott, I love that man. That, that's a, a marvellous example, Stephen, of, um, if you like, how almost a, an editor's knowledge or an editor's skill of different versions can illuminate and, yeah. and inform um, a critical understanding of a particular poem and uh, understand the inner life of, of the character that a biographer is writing about. And it just, I mean, one of the things that's lovely about the new version of the book is that you're able to include um, reproductions of lots of manuscripts in there. So it's very nicely illustrated with the colour images, but also um, there are a number of manuscripts which again will be familiar, I'm sure, to people who visit the Jerwood or who've taken the um, the online course. So you've got uh, the Goslar letter in there, and you've got the Christabel notebook, manuscript A of the Prelude, and then Dorothy's journal and Dora's album and and Salisbury Plain. Um, and I just wonder, this may be our last question before we have a little break, but I just wonder if you could say a bit more about the importance of manuscripts, you know, for you, uh, you know, as an editor, as a critic, and, and as a biographer too. There are so many aspects, Simon, aren't there, to uh, um, a manuscript, and 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 this is, I think, very well brought out in the uh, the, the displays in the museum. Uh, I, as it was, uh, I haven't seen the new museum yet, but I've no doubt it will be true of the new museum too. When you when you handle, um, when I first handled some of the manuscripts in in the Wordsworth Library, some were this big and clearly rather coarsely sewn into a notebook. Some were sheets of paper this big, um, and uh, some are blotted with ink, some are very, very, uh, ah. No, I'm going to try and, I'm going to try and, <laughs> yes. Uh, sorry, that was a bit clumsy. Yeah, um, okay. Can you still hear me? We can hear you and we can yeah. see you. I'm simply yeah, Okay, to... yes, very good. Okay. Well, I, I found myself thinking um, uh, with questions like, um, where did they get the paper? It, 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 clearly, they used all the paper they could. So uh, you write right up to the edge and you, you scroll over and so on. Letters. I wonder whether anybody's ever, ever, ever seen letters where you write from left to right, then you turn the page that way and write up, and then you write a third time obliquely across the page. You're not wasting any any paper. So I found myself thinking about where do they get the paper from? How do they make the ink? What pens are they using? Dorothy Wordsworth's, Mary Wordsworth, Sarah Hutchinson's uh, writing for those beautiful copies of the Prelude. Hundreds of pages of exquisite calligraphy with a, with a, uh, a quill pen? With what kind of ink? So all of these, these questions sorry, all of these sort of questions, yes, indeed, made me think about uh, life at Dove Cottage, where they got the paper from, how they made the ink and this sort of thing. Above all, not wasting anything. We can make multiple copies and store them on our hard disks. We can print out if we want and dump things. We couldn't afford to do that. 
with paper costing what it was, having the difficulties of getting it uh, and wanting to preserve it. Now, in older age, Wordsworth thought he'd lost a lot of manuscripts. And that there's a there's a little, I don't make anything of this in the in the book, but they've lost the key to the trunk in which there are lots of manuscripts. And <laughs> this is like your hard disk crashing. I mean, it's a it's a colossal uh, loss. But they eventually found it, of course. Now, in the manuscript, Jeff, that you were just showing us, I think it was the, the one. Mm. What we've got there is um, a, a rather beautifully, nicely written, fair copy of the poem that Wordsworth was working on throughout the 1790s, which eventually became Adventures on Salisbury Plain. Okay. Um, Wordsworth being Wordsworth, he tried to revise it and change a word here and change a word there. And that's obvious too. You can see that. It was ages before I realized that the darker ink of all of those revisions on those pages is in fact uh, about 40 years later. It's when Wordsworth is revising the poem for what eventually became kind of guilt and sorrow. So on that page, you have, uh, you, you have embodied the sort of lifetime of work of uh, revision from uh, 1799 through to 1841 or something like that. Um, and just trying to um, uh, to to follow through the processes of the poet's thought as he tries one word, then another word, finally settles on one word, is is itself. Uh, a, a, a discipline, uh, a, a, an imaginative discipline, I mean, for the editor. The problem, of course, is you want always to try to give readers everything, and that's that won't do. You, you, I, what I mean is you, you want to finally produce a text of the poem that can be read, not one which is just revision. Uh, is that is that uh, uh, yeah absolutely yeah. Uh, that's a lovely account of it and very uh, clever of jeff to find a, yeah. a suitable manuscript to show us at that point one of the later manuscripts of that that poem the uh, guilt and sorrow um uh, when i first uh, saw it had been revised by wordsworth cutting up pieces of paper and writing his new stuff on the top and then sticking it over the original with sealing wax so you could look at the manuscript and pick it just about peer underneath. Well, of course, the ceiling wax has been removed and so on now, but that's what it was like when I first saw it. You really thought, wow, this is, uh, this is home industry, as it were. I was, I was hoping just to be able to produce that because on the table here, we've got the manuscripts for the new museum. And I thought I could just magically produce it. Well, maybe for the second half, I will. <laughs> And, and that kind of goes full circle again, isn't it? Because that's the manuscript that the words was returned to, prompted by their visit to Walter Scott. Yes, so, yes. Uh, returns to it. But but um, th that's that's a really nice. Um, it's a beautiful manuscript. Um, as as uh, you can lovely see, notebook. Mm, mm. It's, a, it's a traveling document, mm. I guess, to keep it tidy. And then it does have a name. Someone asked what it was called, and it is in the library, known as Manuscript 18A, of course. But I think this is John Carter's hand, where he's labelled the manuscripts, perhaps after Wordsworth's death, and he's called it Ruined Cottage, Salisbury Plain, etc. Oh, so, yeah. uh, yes. uh, I didn't realise that was John Carter's hand, Jeff. How interesting. So I think it, it, what mm. Jeff was talking about, I guess mm. there wouldn't be too many people who would know what were in the manuscripts. No, and no, no Carter, indeed. I guess, would perhaps mm. be one of them, but mm. um, it, it's a beautiful thing. Um, well, maybe at that point we do take a five minute break and uh, when we come back um, we'll have a look at one or two things from your bookshelves behind if, that, if that's okay so it's 2019 if we reconvene at uh, 2024 if that's very okay. good okay. Um, what do i do here says hannah i just press mute you press mute and you stop video
Hello, it's Hannah, your secret panelist, here to do the technical wizardry. <laughs> um, if you have any more questions, please do put them in the chat box, um, keeping note of them as we go, so we'll try not to miss any. Um, in the meantime, um, you can find me over on Twitter. I'm doing a little bit of a live tweet of the event. Um, so if you want to tweet me at Wordsworth Graphs or use the hashtag Disparate Romantics, um, I'll be able to see what you're up to and what you think so far. Um, rather um, cleverly, our local bookshop, Sam Reeves Bookseller, has also tweeted that they are currently selling copies of the book in their online shop. Um, obviously, there are other independent bookshops available, and I will give you a little link now um, that you can use to find your local um, independent bookshop. Um, but I'm sure our local bookshop would also appreciate your custom if you want to pop over to Twitter. Um, they've been very good and uh, working very hard through the pandemic. Um, so yeah, please do keep the questions coming. Um, if you haven't introduced yourself, please do. I know we've got some exciting things to look at after the break as well. Um, I should also probably mention, uh, while I have your attention, um, that our next event is on the 12th of November. And we will be talking to um, Dr. Carrie Andrews from Edgehill University about her new book, Wanderers, A History of Women Walking, which traces the footsteps of 10 women over the past 300 years who have found walking essential to their sense of themselves as people and as writers. And um, I believe that the women um, that she looks at um, include Virginia Woolf and Dorothy Wordsworth. So that's pretty exciting and I can't wait to get my hands on a copy of the book too. Um, after that, the next event is on the 26th of November and we'll be talking to Professor Robert Morrison about his new book, The Regency Revolution. Um, so we've got plenty to take you all the way up to the winter break um, as long as, uh, as, long as um, the internet in our little country abode doesn't die. Um, but yeah, please do. Um, we're back from the break in three minutes. So if you have any more questions, please do keep sending them. I'll collate them for you. Um, chat to me over on Twitter um, if you feel like it. Um, I've been trying to post some good pictures of the manuscripts we've been looking at. Um, you can see you know, my level of skill at a print screening. I'm doing my best. Um, if you didn't catch all the information about the manuscripts that we've been looking at during the event, um, or if you need more details about them, um, please do just get in touch uh, via our contact form on our website. Um, and uh, we'll send, they'll send you through to our curatorial team and we'll be able to tell you exactly what we looked at um, to give you those extra details that we might run over a little bit quickly during the event. Hello, Stephen. Hello, Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> just me, monopolising everybody's attention. Um, I was just telling our viewers um, that our local bookshop, Sam Reads, have very cunningly um, put on social media while this event is happening that they are indeed selling copies of your book. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> and that they have an online shop, um, which I think <laughs> is very uh, cunning of them. <laughs> yes, it's a very good. Uh, uh, it's a bit, that. That shop's been there all, all the time I've been coming to Grasmere, where, whereas lots and lots of the other smaller shops, you know, have gone. But mm -hmm. Sam Reed's remains. That's very good. No, they, they've been working very hard. Um, when lockdown started in March, they had to, to close up the shop, but uh, they built their own website, um, which I think has about 3,000 books for sale on it now, um, which took them a good few months because there's only um, one of them working on the website. Um, he's mm. been trying very hard with it. Um, so they've been finding ways to to kind of get around some of the problems they've been facing. Um, so fingers crossed for them. Um, you know, I think it's been pretty tricky for everyone, but um, it's been really good for me. Um, during um, early lockdown, when uh, they didn't have the website up yet, and uh, when they were still shut, uh, shut if I um, gave them a ring or I sent them an email, they'd find the book I wanted and they'd leave it in the porch for me in the paperback oh, yeah. Yeah, um, so yeah. I could come and collect it from them. Um, yeah. And uh, sometimes the bakery next door would leave little extra bits and bobs they hadn't sold. So you could come and pick up uh, a poetry book and uh, a cake as well. 
That's right. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> right. Yeah. Are I, know, we about I, will, to... I will Go vanish ahead. again. Um, we've got a few more questions uh, coming up in the chat. I don't know if you yet managed to tackle um, Connor James's question um, from much earlier in the chat. Um, I will just paste it again for you um, down I'm, here so I'm it's easier to find. There you go. Oh, yes. So maybe um, we'll come back to that if we could in just a moment, um, mm -hmm. because it's lovely to have a, a, an opportunity here for you to talk about one or two books from your own collection, which, as I said before, is, a, is really impressive, um, not just of the first editions, but those with the association values, which have that extra resonance to them. And I think it was a couple of those you thought you might talk to us about. Mm. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, I think um, as a bibliography and uh, going a book book collecting and so on might might sound for lots of people as, as dry as dust, um, but it isn't. I mean, the 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 books that are published after an author's death or during their lifetime tell you so much that you ought to know or would want to know about the work itself. So take Wordsworth. Um, by 1802, Wordsworth's poems are being published in the United States. Um, by the 1840s, he has um, a fully edited version of his poetry in the US and an editor, Henry Reed, uh, uh, whom he valued very highly indeed. Um, uh, you've got those books in the library and so on. They are, they tell you something about the reach of the poetry there in the first part of the 19th century. But there are other books, and again, you, you have these as I do, the, uh, the, the 1828 Galignani Paris edition. Now this is a pirated edition of Wordsworth, which was designed for English language readers, travelers on Europe, to buy and perhaps uh, have a glance through in Galliani's bookshop in, in Paris. He did such a good job on pirating the books, printed it so nicely that people were importing it back into the UK because it was better than what Longmans were producing at the time. You imagine sort of customs officials opening people's suitcases as they were, hello, hello, what's this? A pirated Wordsworth, we can't have that. I've got, uh, Editions of Wordsworth published in India, in Australia, um, uh, the, the whole sort of reach, if you like, is there. Mm. And the ones that in, in a way thrill me most are the um, some of the very uh, beautiful, small American editions and I, 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 from the 1860s and 70s. I like to fantasize about people in their covered wagons with a tiny Philadelphia edition of, of Wordsworth. Anyway, that's that's the bit. What I thought I would like to just show uh, for our uh, event um, are, are two, two, perhaps just, have we time for three books from my collection? You'll see why they, they matter. <clears throat> Fairly recently, I acquired the four volumes of the 1820 edition of Wordsworth's poems, which appeared to have been inscribed and belonged to somebody whose name might have been Williams. It's written in the book. Ha -ha. What I knew was Wordsworth's first ever published poem, 1787, he's a 17 year old schoolboy. He publishes a poem on uh, hearing Helen Mariah, seeing Helen Mariah Williams weep at a tale of distress. He had not seen Helen Mariah Williams do any such thing. It was a sentimental piece of, of young schoolboy poetry. In 1820, Wordsworth calls on Helen Mariah Millet Williams in Paris and uh, presents her with the uh, new set, four volumes of his collected poems, straight off the press, and I think I have it. The, the Williams inscribed in this book is Helen Mariah Williams. Now, 
this particular moment, here's Wordsworth handing over these books and saying how glad he is to meet Helen Mariah Williams after all these years. And what does he do? What a flatterer. He quotes to her from memory, her sonnet on hope. And she is floored by this. She tells you that in her next edition of her poems. She writes a preface about it. Wordsworth's memory for poetry that he valued was just extraordinary. And I have no doubt at all that he simply summoned it from his memory. He, 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 uh, uh, donkey's years later, he's telling an anthologist that this poem, Helen Mariah Williams' Sonnet to Hope, ought to be in the anthology. It's very fine. Terrific moment. Now, um, does, that, does that work? Yes. That little book is one of four that I know Wordsworth put into the hands of Helen Mariah Williams in um, 1820. Wow. What we have here Eighteen fifteen, Wordsworth published *The White Doe of Ralston* in this large quarto volume. Right. Mm. He gave this copy to Dora, his daughter, from her affectionate father. Okay. At the bottom of the page. It reads, to G. A. Hook, with the undying love of Dora Quillinan, Rydal Mount, May the 21st, 1847. Georgiana Hook, was, uh, the, the Hook family were friends of the Wordsworths. Georgiana Hook was a particular friend of Dora's. Dora Wordsworth gave away the white doe that her father had given her to her friend Georgiana with her undying love. Now the point about this is the date. Dora Wordsworth was in weeks of her death and she knew it. They'd given up all hope of Dora in late April 1847. This is, this is a farewell gift to her friend Georgiana. Um, and I just think there's something um, kind of profoundly moving, really, about about the thought of of uh, such a such a wonderful gesture. Um, of course, as everyone knows, um, uh, Dora's death in 1847 was was the the blow from from which the the poet really never recovered. Uh, none of them did. Um, uh, I wonder whether everyone knows this, Jeff. Um, uh, William and Mary Wordsworth lost two children within six months of each other when they were young. Um, now, all too commonly you hear people say, oh, well, of course, death was very common in those days, wasn't it? And it, it wasn't like it is now. It could hardly be more nonsensical as a, an observation. They were both of them utterly devastated. And of course, as everyone knows, Wordsworth wrote one of his most beautiful sonnets all those years later, surprised by joy. Impatient as the wind, I turned to share the transport with whom but the long buried in the silent to, to his daughter, Catherine. Uh, but Dora, her death, together with the disintegration of Dorothy over many years. Uh, this, I think, meant that the, the uh, well, the stress and the pain in the household at, at Rydal Mount in those last years was very great. Now, the other book I'm going to show you is uh, uh, this <laughs> well, dull, dull book. It's a first edition of the Prelude in um, 1850. And there is the inscription. Okay. John Carter, an affectionate and grateful memorial 
from his friend Mary Wordsworth, Rydalmount, August the 2nd, 1850. John Carter, um, secretary all round helpmate, um, had in fact been responsible for copying one of the manuscripts of the prelude and had been uh, indispensable really to the Wordsworth family for the last 30 years. Here he, here he is getting a copy at last of Mr. Wordsworth's autobiographical poem that he's known to have been working on <laughs> for the last 40 years. It's published in London on July the 27th. This is given to John Carter on August the 2nd. I think it's the first box that came up on the train from London it's come on the carrier from Kendall. Mary's opened it. And there she is giving it to the man who has shared that poem with her all these years. Now, I wonder what, what were they both feeling? Um, you see, uh, they'd lived with the existence of this poem. Mary had lived with the existence of this poem the whole of her married life. Carter had known about it uh, for not quite such a long time, but had been deeply involved in the creation of it in the manuscripts. Now, at last, it's published, but its subject is dead. It's the growth of a poet's mind is the subtitle of the poem, but he's dead. And for both of them, this, this, book, this book must both have been uh, a, a sort of memorial stone, but also a, a source of great joy and, and gladness, I think. So I'm very pleased indeed to have a copy, which we know was in Mary Wordsworth's hands and John Carter's. Um, now, uh, there's at least another hundred books, Jeff, here that I could talk okay. about, but I think we better not. <laughs> the, the, the thing again, I've heard you say about that book too, is the thought that they might have had for the people who were no longer with them. So oh, yes. the poem to Coleridge um, and Dorothy, of course, not well by this point. So it was, it was almost, as you've told me before, it was like absent friends as well as that particular moment, wasn't it? You're absolutely right, of course, of course. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the poem is addressed to Coleridge and up to the 1830s, that wasn't a fiction, it was still properly addressed to Coleridge. Mm. After the 1830s, it, it's a literary fiction. And by the time it comes out, uh, Coleridge is, it, it is uh, uh, even more than a, of a historical figure than, it, than its writer, William Wordsworth. But Dorothy, uh, um, who's, Summoned so very beautifully, I think, in 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 ooh, book eleven, is it of the play? Book twelve. Um, uh, she she was suffering from dementia and um, all. I, I imagine. I know. I get very sentimental about this, Jeff, and I can see how how uh, how one might. I would imagine that the poet put a copy of that book into Dorothy's, not the poet, <laughs> Mary, put a copy of that book into Dorothy's hands uh, um, because uh, both Mary and Dorothy outlived him by some years, as you know. I mean, if, yes, you've, you've brought, you've just perfectly um, shown how these things mm. have stories. And and the, and the meaning to to so many people involved, the meaning that it can bring to us, and and I think sometimes you so often see, don't you, in secondhand shops, you'll open it, it'll say, you know, from so and so to Auntie Jeannie Christmas. Yes, and yes. You think that's another one of those, another one of those, but every mm. one of those could mm. be a, sort of a moment, like you've described. It, mm. it, it has meaning, and it reminds us. It reminds mm. us. Of that. Mm. Um, we should ask a question from the chat box. Um, this is, uh, may I ask whether Stephen feels that eco-criticism is a useful mode of reading with which to explore William Wordsworth's work? Absolutely, and without doubt. Um, and I would, I would want to say honestly that um, 
that Wordsworth himself would have said, yes, yes, uh, here, let me sell you a copy of my guide to the lakes. Um, we haven't mentioned the fact that the, that the uh, in a way, in Wordsworth's lifetime, uh, the most read work of his was in fact a, a topographical description of the scenery of the lakes. The book that later became known generally as the guide to the lakes. And the, um, I, I don't, uh, it's only very partially a guide. And it is a topographical description, but it, it's, a, it's a profound meditation really upon uh, the natural world, um, what it means to get to know it and live in it, um, the importance of it. Uh, um, so yes, Jeff, I, it seems to me, um, it, it's a while back, isn't it? Jonathan Bate, can you remind me of the title of his book? He, he, he wrote a book about... Uh, the Romantic Ecology? Uh, yes, that's the one, yes, yes. It's a, it's a good starter in this, this moment. Uh, and 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 right and good, I think. And so yes. So to everybody taking part in this webinar, uh, please rush and uh, and read the guide to the lakes. Um, well, I think particularly in this edition. Uh, well, if <laughs> this is, I get no financial benefit from that, so I'm not making a plug. <laughs> We've got a question, uh, Stephen, from. Anthony Harding, ah, yes. well known to many of us, for, who is currently in, in Wolfville, Nova Scotia. Thank you very much for joining us, Anthony, and sending in your question. And he, he kind of picks up on two of the things you've mentioned so far, in a way, or, or links to two of the things you've just talked about. I mean, one of which is, is sort of words, if you like words with international influence, because you, you were talking before about how interested you are in different versions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, different editions of Wordsworth that you've collected from around the world. And of course, you know, I'm aware the words that the prelude has been uh, translated into Chinese. And uh, as, as Jeff mentioned, um, we also have the translator of your own, translator into Chinese of your own book at the moment. So there is that sort of global spread of Wordsworth. Um, but then also Wordsworth is very well known for the, for the local, you know, his emphasis on the local, as you say, and for his, his guide to the lakes. And, um, I hope Anthony doesn't mind me slightly just um, shortening his, his question. It's there in the chat if people want to, to read the whole question. Um, but he talks about a lot of critical work, which has put the emphasis on place and on the local in Wordsworth's later writing, particularly the 1820 volume, the Duddon Sonnets. Um, and he asks if you've got any worries from a wider perspective that these arguments that emphasise the local, the Lake District, um, do they reduce? Do they reduce Wordsworth to a purely English and even provincial poet, lacking importance for readers in, say, North America or Australia, or for that matter, France, Germany, Italy, and Poland? I, I, I think you would have to say that uh, one could well imagine how an emphasis upon the local and the, uh, the topographical would make Wordsworth seem, as it were. Um, the provincial anonymity. But that's to say, these, these presentations were, I think, not to be articulating the right thing. The remarkable thing about, say, Burns, whom Wordsworth adored, uh, Thomas Hardy, Seamus Heaney, um, Yeats, these are all writers, aren't they, with a global reach who had been immensely uh, important, but the power of whose writing uh, uh, wells up from their commitment to a place, to the local, to the specific, to what they really know. Um, and so it does, I think, with Wordsworth. We would have to say it's perfectly clear that Wordsworth has reached people very widely who, who have never seen Westminster Bridge or Elberlin, if it comes to that, um, but who respond to a poetry which is built on that kind of um, local intimacy. I wonder, I, I, I guess this, uh, this question might possibly come up. And so, got hold of this. This is a little bit of George Eliot that has meant a lot to me over the years, a great deal. 
It's her essay on uh, world, it's called Worldliness and Otherworldliness, the poet Young. And she contrasts the poetry of Young with the poetry of William Cooper. And at the very end of her essay, she says this. The sum of our comparison is this. In Young, we have the type of that deficient human sympathy, that impiety towards the present and the visible, which flies for its motives, its sanctities and its religion to the remote, the vague and the unknown. In Cooper, we have the type of that genuine love, which cherishes things in proportion to their nearness and feels its reverence grow in proportion to the intimacy of its knowledge. Now, I think if you put Wordsworth's name in there instead of Cooper, you've got a marvellous, there's a certain rightness about that, uh, cherishes things in proportion to their nearness. It, it, it doesn't mean that that's all, but that's the source of your power. Uh, do you remember that passage in the prelude where Wordsworth suddenly says, the hiding, the hiding places of my power seem open, I approach, they, they close. When age comes on, may scarcely see at all. And I would give as far as words can give, a substance and a life to what I feel. Now, the hiding places of Wordsworth's power, uh, I think are the local, the things he knew, the things he loved. Um, the place he looked. Yeah. yeah. Sim, we might have uh, say one more question from from the chat box, mm. and this is one um, which is really about Dorothy's writings, Dorothy's later writings, and uh, it's from Heidi Snow, and she said uh, I've seen a few evidences of Dorothy's revisitings in her later journals. Um, how would you distinguish the type of revisitings of past events, that's in terms of reassessing or remembering, that Dorothy does from what William does? So I guess. Are her rememberings in a different way? I, Jeff, I don't think I know enough to answer that question, but I would, from what I do know, I would say I thought they're very, very close to one another in the way they remember and respond. Um, there's a there's both a continuity of feeling and an integration of feeling between brother and sister, I think, on questions of memory, which is very remarkable. And I, I, that's really all I can say, Jeff. I think I don't, I don't really have an answer other than to say I think they were the same. I think the, the only one I can think of there is, is, the, is the poems on a sickbed. Mm, yes. Being the prisoner and, and she can remember being at the Y, can't she? Yes, exactly. Yes, 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 that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're drawing towards, uh, because we haven't even mentioned the ode yet, we can't have a, a, an event like this with, without talking about the ode. And so to give you an opportunity maybe to, to think about the, the, the great poems too that we might have not have mentioned, but, but also um, I just want to encourage people if they haven't seen this book, um, and you've got to get the right one of these, there's at least two of these, <laughs> um, but one of them's got an, an introductory essay, of course, by yourself, and in it, you talk about, if you like, why words of matters. What's his great? What's his greatness? What's his? Why is he? If I suppose the word of the day will be innovative. What? Why is he remarkable? And in it itself, this is a remarkable essay, and I've turned to it many times in this. But I wonder, uh, in terms of that question, you know, it, why? We don't want to talk about the words relevance, but why does? What is the value of words of today? What does he offer us? In in the little film that we do to introduce to Cottage, you say. The words that most, that most often come up are joy and love. Clearly, that's something words with offers us. But how would you how would you answer that? Um, after I'd written Wordsworth and the Victorians book, I got really um, a very moving number of letters from people who wanted to tell me what Wordsworth had meant to them. Uh, and they were picking up on one of the chapters in the book of, about people who witnessed what Wordsworth had meant to them. And again and again, Jeff, people wrote about Wordsworth giving them strength. An interesting word. Wordsworth's poetry to me, uh, 
seems to en embody the effort of a man who was determined to lose nothing, to keep hold of everything that he, that he could, and to sort of, to, to, to make sense of it through a very powerful, joyous, positive commitment to life. Yeah. I know this all sounds very vague, but do you remember in Tintin Abbey, um, he tells us about the, uh, the, the joy of what he calls thoughtless youth and animal enjoyment of life. That time is past and all its aching joys are now no more than all its dizzy raptures. Not for this faint eye, nor more, nor murmur. For such lost, I would believe, abundant recompense. Now, this is the note of Wordsworth's poetry. Okay, let's, let's remember and evoke what was. Let's accept loss when we have to accept loss. But let's find abundant recompense in what remains behind. He does that through love, uh, through a sense of, uh, of, of continuing kind of joy and, and pleasure. And, but it's the determination to hold it all together, Jeff, which I think, uh, which is why I think a poem like um, The Intimations Ode is such a very great poem. Here, here you start with four stanzas in which um, the fact is, there was a time when meadow, grove and stream, the earth and every common sight to me did seem apparelled in celestial light, the glory and the freshness of a dream. It is not now. That's the beginning of this poem. Ah, if the poem had ended there, where is it now? The glory and the dream, end of stanza four. Well, it would have been a lovely, but rather Hardy-esque poem about loss. But what we have, is, is Wordsworth returning to that poem two years later and developing his theme through some idea about the child coming, trailing clouds of glory and so on. But then the, the, the conclusion, the, the conclusion. And as I just get older, this poem seems to me to continue to resonate and, and speak. The way in which he talks about, um, though this has gone and that has gone, we will grieve not, rather find strength in what remains behind. Do you remember the, the closing lines? And then, um, how do you read that ending? To me, the meanest flower that blows can give thoughts that do often lie too deep for tears. Now, you either put your emphasis upon the word tears, which makes it oh, a very sad ending, or as I invariably do, Thoughts that are often lie too deep for tears. It's the depth that you're emphasizing there in the line of poetry. Um, so to everybody attending this webinar, uh, I want to say first, yes, you've got to go and read the guide to the lakes, but that'll take some time. Commit the ode, intimations of immortality to memory. And that will see you through. <laughs> That's a slight hyperbole. <laughs> only, only slight in my Everybody view. Everybody with Stephen, thank you. <laughs> um, it's been a, a pleasure to listen to you as ever. I mean, you talked earlier about Wordsworth as a man who was, who you felt was always just able to summon from his own head the particular quotation that he needed. Um, and hearing you talk, it always feels as if you know, not only do you have the entirety of Wordsworth's works within your own head, but also you have the biography there too, and are able to just draw on the information um, to answer the questions that people have, have put to you, and as you did at the end, to remind us why the poetry what, is so what, mm, mm. Yeah, Thank you so much for tonight. No, thank you for inviting me. Mm. And, and I think that what the um, there's a, a comment um, in the chat box that says thank you uh, Stephen, for your enthusiasm and erudition in responding to our questions, and I think that sums it up perfectly. Um, I, we could we could talk much for much longer, but um, the book, yes, the book. Um, this this is, and it's just a pleasure to read, as you can tell. It's 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 like your voice comes through that we've heard tonight, 
if you like the live voice comes through in this and you get to know the poetry and you get to know the man and it's fine value how many pages of footnotes did you say jeff oh hundreds and hundreds well there you are yes <laughs> honestly, i read those first um <laughs> but only 20 25 pounds uh, yeah but, 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 so our next um event as hannah was saying before um is on hannah is it the it's the 12th of november and it's dr kerry andrews um and it's one talking about her book wanderers a history of women walking and you mentioned the guide to the lakes uh, later in the series, mm. uh, Professor Nick Mason from Brigham Young University is going to join us because they've put uh, an edition of the guide, just about every every version of the guide from select views of 1810 onwards, all the variants right through the different editions. That's now live and available on the Romantic Circles website. Wonderful. Mm. Drawn on mm. manuscripts and, and books from this collection. So that's something really to look forward to later in the series. Um, Anna, I think I think we're drawing to a conclusion. I think we are. Um, so yes, the next event is on the 12th of November. Um, you might receive a survey in an email from Eventbrite tomorrow that we'd really appreciate you filling out just so that we can think more about what events we can offer you in future. Um, I've been live tweeting this event on Twitter. So if you want to relive some of my favorite moments, um, please go and have a look and come to the next one. And so to thank everyone for joining us tonight, uh, just to end again, thank you, Stephen. That's just been such a treat and uh, a very, very memorable evening. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Good night. Good time. night. Good night, everybody. OK, everybody, we can leave the meeting. Go to the red button in the bottom right hand corner. Farewell, Hannah. See you soon. <laughs>